But here we are again. I think a wonderful book to study and to consider and to think about, especially as we embark on a new year. Christians need a resolution. And not just every year, but each day of our life. We, we need to have an understanding of what it is we are doing, what it is we are believing, where it is we are going. And Colossians is a wonderful book to start off the new year. As we think about those things, as we think about our relationship to Christ, His relationship to us, and, and how that meets the world through us. How it meets our family through us, how it meets our friends and our co-workers, how it meets the lost through us. So the book of Colossians, there's so much to dig into, there's so much to think about and to meditate on and to hide and ponder in our hearts. So hopefully as we go through this book, uh, you will enjoy it, you will learn from it, and perhaps we will all be inspired to live deeper Christian lives, to walk closer with the Lord as we live with Him and as we make our way toward heaven. So let's begin. We read here in verse 1 as we look at the greeting of Paul the Apostle to the Colossian church. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Now, Paul reminds these people, as he does in all of his letters, that he is an apostle. And as he so often says, he is an apostle, not by his own will. If you look into his story in the book of Acts, Paul's will was not to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, but Paul's will was to destroy the work of the apostles of Jesus Christ. He was on his way to arrest disciples of Christ. He was on his way to cause further turmoil and destruction upon the church of Jesus Christ when he was knocked off his high horse, so to speak, as he saw the light of Christ there on the road to Damascus. And on that day, he was converted. He was saved. On that day, he repented and he turned around and he went the other way. No longer was he a foe of Jesus Christ, but he was a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. No longer would he be attempting to destroy the work of the church, but he would now be building up the work of the church. And ironically, he would be the one to do more for the work of Christ in the early church than perhaps anyone else. The one who fought the fiercest against it became the one most passionate for the work of Christ in his church as Paul planted so many of them. So here is Paul. He's an apostle and it sure, certainly wasn't by his own will that this came to pass. God broke that hard heart of Saul of Tarsus and here he is, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Perhaps it is worthy for us just to briefly cross-reference John's words in his opening prelude to his gospel, where he says of those who received Christ. He says in chapter 1, verse 12, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. Now, these who believe in Christ, these who become children of God, notice what John says. They were not born of, of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Our Christian parentage is different than our human parentage. It is not by human will that we have been brought into the family of God, but by God's will. The will of God has not only paved the way for our salvation in Jesus Christ and His work on the cross, but also the Spirit's work within us to draw us to Jesus Christ. We are His because of His will, and Paul understood this perhaps better than many of us. I grew up in a Christian home. I, I don't really know what it's like not to be a Christian person. Yet Paul was completely on the other side of the fence. He was fighting tooth and nail against this thing, against the church, against this wicked cult as he saw it, this perversion of Judaism as he thought. He fought so 
so hard against it and now here he is an apostle for it an apostle by the will of God so often that's how the will of God is in our lives it moves us in directions that are often in opposition to anything we would we would have ever thought before so often the will of God takes us in the other direction at the fork in the road than the one we would have normally chose I remember thinking to myself, I've shared it here before, as a child growing up, watching my grandfather, watching my father, watching them preach from the pulpit, oh, I would never want to do that. I don't know how they get up there and talk in front of people. It seems so difficult. But the will of God is like that. It wasn't my will, but it's His will. And so often the will of God leads us in ways that we would have never chosen. And yet, when it is the will of God, He empowers us to do those things we would have never thought feasible, never thought possible. You've heard the pastor say so many times that he was just a meek and timid little fellow. He couldn't preach in front of people, and yet it has become his great passion. Just, just like Paul would have never chosen to be this apostle of Christ, so often it is with us. The Lord's will takes us down paths we would have never dreamed. And then Timothy, Brother Timothy, Paul and Timothy together writing this letter to the Colossians, to the saints, to the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Now, Colossae was a city, you know the seven letters in the book of Revelation. The Colossian church was in that group of territory, was in that realm of Asia Minor, what we would call today Turkey. It's the, it would be the south, most southeastern city in that region. You remember you have Ephesus and Philadelphia and Smyrna and Thyatira and Sardis and Laodicea. Laodicea is right next door to Colossae. About 11 miles southeast is where you would find this church if you were in Laodicea and took a turn down that way. About 120 miles inland from Ephesus, which was on the coast. But this was a place that Paul had never been. This was a church that Paul had not founded. This was a place that he had heard about, as he'll tell us, but he had not ministered there personally. And we'll see that come into play a little bit as we go along. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. His typical greeting. Grace to you and peace and truly grace and peace is that which comes from God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ as he says we could look at it and just pass it off as as a typical greeting but I think for Christians this greeting wasn't just hi and hello nice to meet you but they were constantly reminding each other of the grace of God and of the peace that they had with God. A little miniature gospel every time they would say hello and write a letter. Grace to you and peace. And this grace and peace comes through the Father, through the Son. Now, Paul perhaps writes around 60 or 61. He's in prison perhaps in Rome. There are some debates about when and where he was. But most evangelical conservative scholars See Colossians as part of that group of letters that Paul wrote while he was imprisoned in Rome. You remember in the book of Acts, it leaves off with him in house arrest. He's able to minister and preach the gospel there under house arrest, and his ministry actually flourishes there in Rome. And yet, if this is indeed the time when he writes, if it is in 60 or 61, a little before, a little after, right in there, it just so happens that history tells us that a terrible earthquake struck the city of Colossae around that time, about 61. So it is interesting, if Paul is writing after that earthquake, after this devastating earthquake, it is said by some scholars that the city never really recovered after the earthquake and was truly decimated by the catastrophe that it brought. There are several verses in Colossians that reminds them to stand firm in the foundation of Christ. Look at verse 23. He speaks about them continuing in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. 
And you'll see passages like that in chapter 2. Verse 7, he talks about being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. So there's a, a few times when Paul seems to speak about how their foundation in Christ is firm, it's secure, it's unmovable. And he may be drawing on the tragedy that they have suffered if indeed he's writing after that terrible earthquake. So that's just something to keep in your mind. I found it a little interesting. Perhaps you will as well. How important it is that no matter what goes on around us, no matter what might shake beneath our feet as we live in this world, that we are to be established upon the rock that is Christ. You want to be a wise man in Christ's eyes or a wise woman in the, in the eyes of Christ? What did he say? Then you need to be the kind of person that hears my word and obeys it and does it and keeps it. I liken that person, he says in the Gospel of Matthew, to a wise man who builds his house, who builds his life upon the rock. When the trials of life, when the rains come and when the floods rise, that person, that house will not be moved. And so it is possible that Paul is alluding to the sufferings that they have endured because of that earthquake. But like I said, he might have written the, the letter a little earlier than that. So. We see his greeting to this church that he has not personally met before. And notice his thanksgiving that he offers on, on their behalf, hearing about them. He says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now, this should have warmed their heart, I imagine. Surely they know of Paul, even if he does not know them personally. He's one of the great apostles. They have heard of his ministry, no doubt. We'll, we'll learn in verse 7 that Epaphras is somebody who was uh, perhaps the founder of their church or somebody very important in their church, one of their leaders in the church of, of Colossae. And Epaphras was one who had told Paul about their love and their faith and the hope that they had in the Lord and of the work of God in this place. And Paul says, I give thanks for that and I'm also praying for you. I, I know you've heard about me and I don't know your faces. I don't know really any of you people, but I'm praying for you because I've heard that you've been brought into the family of God of which I'm a part. And so we're family even though we haven't met each other formally and personally. We're praying for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints and because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. There is that trilogy that Paul often brings together of faith, hope, and love. He's heard how they have professed Christ. They have put their faith in him. They are living for him. And this, this faith has lived out in their actions. I have heard of how you love the saints. Now, he doesn't go into uh, some detail about what he means, but their actions were loving towards the people of God. They were those who were helpful to those in need, perhaps. They demonstrated their love for the saints of God, for other people who were Christians. They demonstrated that they had faith by the life that they lived. Such a lesson for us. And because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. I love how Paul phrases that together there. The word of the truth of the gospel. This word, this message, which is a truthful message, and it is the good news, this message of salvation in Jesus Christ. Ever since you have heard about it, you professed faith, you demonstrated love, and I know that you have a hope laid up for you. You are heirs of the promises of God in Christ, which has come to you, the gospel which has come to you, verse 6, as it has also, notice this, in all the world. See, this comes on the heels of the book of Acts. The book of Acts ends with Paul under house arrest in Rome, and this book is written just a year, two, or three right after that, right on the heels of the book of Acts. And Paul could say, the gospel has gone out through the whole world. Yes, you have heard the gospel, but it has also been sounded forth and proclaimed throughout the whole world. 
And of course, he means the whole civilized world of their time. We read in the annals of the Christian church that Thomas perhaps went as far as India and others went out as, as far as perhaps the borders of China. Others had gone into Africa and over into Europe. Paul himself had scattered the seed of God's word and his gospel throughout the Mediterranean region, planting numerous churches, especially there in the regions of Greece and Asia Minor. The gospel in such a short time. Jesus, he ascends somewhere in the early 30s. Here we are in the early 60s. It's only been a generation. It's only been 30 years or so. And the gospel is sounded forth in all the world. I mean, picture that. Uh, from 1990, perhaps you could remember things you were doing 30 years ago in 1990. 30 years, that's not very long. It, maybe when I was a kid it sounded like it was a whole long time, but these days I, I remember what I was doing in 1990 in the fifth grade. So in 30 years, in the span of 30 years, the gospel had sounded forth through all the world and is bringing forth fruit, the gospel is, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Notice how he phrases that, how you heard the grace of God in truth. As we go through the letter, that's one of the things we're going to notice. He wants to emphasize what it means to understand in truth the grace of God, the gospel of God, what Jesus has done for you and for me. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But Paul is emphasizing truth in this letter. Not that he doesn't emphasize truth elsewhere in his letters, but here he wants to establish the importance of right doctrine for right faith and right living as we are servants of Christ in this world we want to have the truth of Christ in our hearts our ministry will be affected negatively if we have the wrong notions of the gospel the wrong ideas about Christ and so we will see right off especially as we go just through chapter one how Paul emphasizes the importance of who Jesus Christ is and what we must believe about the Son of God so here he sort of gives a prelude to that. You knew the grace of God in truth, and I'm going to remind you about that truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, now here's that leader of their church, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Now, Paul hadn't been to this church, as we said, but he knows Epaphras. Epaphras has served with Paul. Epaphras is the connection. He's the link between Paul and the Colossian church. We're not exactly sure what was the motivation for the writing of this letter and of the many things it handles and takes care of and clarifies the truth of the grace of God as we were talking about. Why was it that Paul wrote this letter? What were the problems? What were the errors? Well, apparently Epaphras had gone to Paul and says, look, we're dealing with some important issues. You're an apostle. We've heard about you, even though you didn't found this church, even though we've never met you personally, we could use some correction in doctrine. We could use some deep understanding in theology. Paul, my church needs help. Can you address the issues that we have been facing? And there was a strong Jewish presence in this city. And we can tell from some of the things that we will read throughout the letter that perhaps there was some issues similar to what we read in the book of Galatians, where you had Judaizers, as they were called, people who professed Christ, but said you must be a Jew first before you become a Christian. You must adopt the law of Moses and all that that entails, and then you can become a Christian. In other words, to be a Christian, you must also be a Jew. And we'll see shades of that in this letter for sure, but there does seem to be more than that. It does seem that there was other issues going on that may have had a pagan nature about them rather than simply a Jewish nature about them. And we'll see that, especially as we look in chapter 2, Paul will begin to go down uh, some of the dangers 
He'll, he'll talk about this philosophy of empty deceit that has been trying to sneak into your church. So they were under some, some wicked influences. There were some things that were challenging the people in the church. Now, we don't read in this letter any rebukes, and Paul was not one to shy away from a rebuke. He tells the Galatians, who has bewitched you? What's going on that you're turning away from the faith? We read in the Corinthian letters how uh, I'm ashamed of some of the things you are doing that aren't fitting for people of God. We don't see that in Colossians. So it seems that the church was holding strong, and yet there were these underlying issues that needed to be addressed. People needed to have a firmer understanding of the truth in order to face the conflicts that were coming against them theologically, ideologically, things that were attempting to subvert and pervert the gospel that they had received. Epaphras had been a great leader, apparently. This church was a wonderful church. He, I have heard of your faith. I have heard of your love. I have heard of the hope that you have. And yet, let me help you with some of the errors that you are facing. Let, let me give you some help as far as who Christ is, what he has done, and how that relates to our religion, how that relates to our faith in Christ. And so there were some important issues, and yet we don't see a rebuke, we see help. And so that's helpful to see as we go through the letter. Now, in verse 9, verses 9 through 12, Paul prays for the people. He, he sort of writes out, here's my prayer for you. And as we think about this new year of 2021, I find these verses to be excellent as far as committing ourselves to a Christian resolution. Let us see what Paul prayed for them and perhaps ask ourselves if it isn't something we should be praying for ourselves in the upcoming year. This was a church that lived in a time when paganism was the majority. In our country, as, as much as we seem to be going the wrong way in so many areas of life, we still have a strong Christian presence. Yet imagine living in a time and in a place where maybe you were the only, you and your friends in this little Colossian house church, you were the only Christians you knew. All of the rulers, all of the leaders, all of the, the, the civic authorities, all of the people you worked with, nobody else was a Christian. And to be a Christian in the Roman Empire was something that often was something that maybe was a thing for slaves. And so it sort of would be offensive sometimes for a rich person to even consider Christ because, well, isn't that the religion of slaves? That's what makes the conversion of people like Philemon so important, where they realized that this wasn't just a religion for the poor, this was a religion for all people. The gospel was for all people. But they're living in a time and in a place where Christianity is the smallest of minorities. They're living in a time and a place under Roman rule, under paganism outright. There are temples where you can go worship these false gods. I mean, you know, we get a little uncomfortable when we see the mosques, you know, rising up. But they don't outnumber the churches quite yet. Well, imagine if there wasn't a Mountain View Baptist Church or any other church in Ontario. Imagine if we were just getting together at the pastor's house and that was it. There's a handful of us in the house. And as the church grew, well, maybe, maybe we have a few other houses, but that's as big as it is. We don't got a temple. We don't got a building. We don't have a place. And people look at us and wonder, well, what is that, a cult? What are they involved in? What are they, what are they doing over there in secret, those Christians? And rumors begin to spread about you. And it begins to harm your reputation. You're, are you part of that Christian cult? We can't imagine what that's like. But I think we're getting closer to a time when the book of Colossians is more meaningful to us in America today than perhaps it was in the past, as Christianity quickly is on the decline in our country, as churches are closing up shop, and as Christians are gathering and conglomerating and sort of consolidating in mega churches, you got bigger churches, but you got fewer churches. You got mega churches, but you got fewer Christians. We, we are entering a time in this nation where 
when the generation that Christian is a part of, that Jonathan is a part of, that Jenna Marie is a part of, when their generation is my age, they will live in a time in this country when there are more atheists than have ever been before. And those atheists will be in places of power. Those atheists will be in places of law. Those atheists will be in places where they can influence people. Not that atheism hasn't had a small influence up till now, but I don't think we are prepared to see what's about to happen in the next generation. We are about to experience what the Colossians experienced. We're about to become the minority. We're about to, we have already begun to become those people that instead of looking at Christians, well, that's a nice thing to be. I just don't believe in it, but it's nice for them. Sort of how maybe we are with Mormons. We were talking about Mormons the other day. We, we passed the big, huge, I forgot how big it was, the Mormon temple in Los Angeles. It just was a spectacle to behold how large it was. And you might say, well, Mormons are good people. They're not hurting anybody. But these days, the church is looked at with sort of a slanted eye. Wait a minute. I don't think you guys are helpful in our culture, in our country. I think you guys might actually be the problem in our culture and in our country. We are entering that kind of time. And so, with all of these influences coming against us, we can think about the influences that were coming against them and perhaps notice that there is a lot for us to learn from the book of Colossians. A lot to learn, a lot to be inspired by, a lot to be encouraged with. So for this reason, he says, verse 9, Since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you. Now what is he asking? That you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now that's an important prayer. As we begin this year, this is something we should be praying. Lord, help me to have spiritual insight. Help me to have a spiritual mindset. Help me to have a knowledge of your will. Help me to have wisdom and understanding and discernment. Help me to think differently. Help me to think not worldly, but otherworldly. Not naturally, but supernaturally. Not secularly, but Christianly. Oh, the philosophies of this age, they can so easily sneak into our minds and corrupt the way we think. We need to sweep the floor clean as if it were and remind ourselves that this should be our prayer, to think God's thoughts after him, to know his will, to have his wisdom, his understanding, his discernment. We need to think differently. This was Paul's prayer for the Colossians. And this is a good prayer for us. Lord, help me to think differently. Help me to reevaluate my thoughts about things so that I can make sure my thoughts line up with your will, your wisdom, your understanding. That you, verse 10, may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Oh, this is good. So not only how we think now, but how we live. We should not only think differently, but we should live differently. How do we want to live? Do you want to have a walk, a life that is pleasing to, to God, to your Father? Jesus said, I always do those things that please my Father. Do we always do those things? Are we trying to always do those things? Are we having a fruitful experience in the Lord? Are we increasing in the knowledge of God? Think differently and live differently. If we're thinking like the world, that's a bad sign. If we're living like the world, that's even worse. It starts how we think because how we think affects how we live and how we act and how we conduct ourselves. We want to have a walk, a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And Paul says that you might be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. So you think differently, you live differently, but also you react to things differently when trials come your way, when difficulties and conflicts rise up in your life, you are strengthened with the might of God. You have His power working in you so that you, through His, notice this, His glorious power, His majestic might, His kingly presence, that it might help you to have all patience and long-suffering with a smile on your face, with joy. See, that's, that's the difference 
the noticeable difference of Christians in the world. We face what they face, what the world faces. We, we suffer things that are common to man, but yet we face them differently. We can have joy even in sorrow. Even when we're struggling, we know that we have the hope of Christ, the hope of glory, as Paul will say in this very letter. And so not only do we think differently, we live differently, but we react to things, we experience things differently with joy. This world often hits you in such a way that it can take away your joy. But our joy is established in Christ, high above this world where nothing can touch it. And we should set our gaze upon him, as he'll say in chapter 3. We should be focused on Christ and on where we are going. We're not citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven. And so we react differently. We react with joy in our patience and in our long-suffering, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. And the last thing I'll leave you with is the wonders of his grace. Because do you notice what he said here? He gave thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of this wonderful inheritance of heaven. This wonderful inheritance of the saints that we have in the light of the glory of God. What has he done? He has qualified us. We were unqualified for these things because of sin. We were disqualified. There, there was no way that this could be our inheritance. And yet God has taken us, placed us in Christ, who has paid the penalty of all of our sins, who has given us all of his righteousness, and because of Christ, we are now qualified for things that we were disqualified from. Incredible. The disqualified have become qualified. Not because of anything we have done, but because of everything he has done for us. So these are the things I want to leave you with. A church that was struggling and having conflict with the world around them. The political world, the governmental world, the religious world, the pagan world, the secular world. Everything was coming against them to pervert the gospel they had received. To affect the things that they believed about Christ. The way they lived for him. And Paul says, let me help you. Here's this letter. I know I haven't met you, but I'm praying for you. I love you, and I want to help you. And so hopefully we can receive that in the way it was written, even in our day, so that we might think differently, that we might live differently, and that we might react to this world differently. Or if I can put it a different way, to think like a Christian, to live like Christ, and to react as we should, knowing that we have a treasure reserved for us in heaven.